Good morning, YouTube, and welcome into Longwood University Communication Studies Department Presents live original undergraduate research streaming session here. I'm your host today, Dr. Ryan Stouffer, joined by always as my co-host, Dr. Alec Osterman. Good morning. And we, and longtime viewers may notice, we're in a different location. This is our eighth edition here, and we are proud to be coming to you live from the, bal the balcony of Blackwell Hall here in the Rotunda on Longwood University's campus. Today is the university-wide research day here, and so we're proud to participate this year live from the balcony here. So we'll get into what our students are doing and then who this is being produced by. So what our students did, both of our students all semester, is they conducted original research here. And so essentially they asked questions. They collected data to answer those questions. They interpreted those answers to the questions. And what's always cool about original research here is these students now know something that nobody else in the world knows, right? I think that's pretty darn cool here. Uh, they have a little slice of knowledge, right? It's not, it's not everything, but they know something nobody else in the world does here. So, uh, Dr. Hosman, why don't you tell them about how your students collected data? Uh, in terms of the research, research went the same way. We collect the data through interview process. So our students ended up interviewing 12 different students uh, or participants and then did a thematic analysis of what we found in terms of that, creating themes and coming up with some really interesting uh, observations that they could talk about. Nice. So my students took a slightly different approach. They did a quantitative approach, right? So they got their math on. And so they all conducted surveys and they're supposed to have at least 100 respondents. Some were more successful than others. Uh, but then they took for that and they looked for large patterns of communication, right? We believe that uh, we humans are predictable, right? We're not all the same, but we are predictable. And that's what we were looking for with that quantitative point of view, those large patterns here. And so they did some fun math things, did some t-test correlations, things like that. And then, of course, they analyzed the results and have similar conclusions, potentially, to uh, Dr. Hossman's students just from a different point of view. So that's a little bit about what our students are doing. One of the other cool things about this event is it allows us to not only present original research, it also allows us to showcase what our students can do on the production side of things here. So if we cut to the behind the scenes camera, we can take a look at this broadcast as all student produced here. So we'll have some different crews throughout the day. They'll be rotating thing and they will be doing the live streaming all day. We'll be here till almost three o'clock. Uh, so it'll be a long day of fun stuff ahead of us. So that's a pretty cool aspect to show not only the research our students do, but how they produce it. One person we need to thank who without all him, and this would not be possible, and that's Mr. Jace Frank right there. Give him a huge round of applause. He set up our first ever live mobile studio here <laughs> on location. It's been a great challenge over the last of course days, but we are very excited here to participate in Longwood University's Research Day. So stay tuned. We'll have some special guests later, and Hannah Bailey will be up soon with her first presentation.
Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Bailey and my research focuses on the interactions between gender, musical identity, platform use, and genre. Prior research has connected some of these constructs, but no research has put them all together. My research is guided by the communications theory of uses and gratifications, which describes the idea that people are active in their media consumption, for example, streaming music for a purpose. The second theory I used was the sociological theory of social identity theory, which describes that individuals put themselves and in people like them in in-groups and people dissimilar to them in out-groups. I had three hypotheses to guide my research and connect the constructs. My research, had, my research study had 36 questions with 27 close-ended, 6 open-ended, and 3 demographics questions. It took approximately 5 minutes to complete, and the questions targeted musical identity and how and why people listen to music. After removing responses deemed unrelated, the total, final total was 219. The median and average age was 40, and the mode age was 20. The first hypothesis was uh, there was no significant interaction found, and the second and post hoc hypothesis had significant interactions. The first construct was gender identity. Gender is a primary social distinction, and I had one demographic question to ask people what gender they identified as. 84, I had, my survey found 84% women and 14% men, but this research found no significant differences in the ways that the genders answered the questions. My second construct is musical identity. Musical identity describes the importance of music in one's life, and I had multiple choice and open-ended questions to ask people about their musical identity. Common themes people reported on the open-ended questions were music is necessary, relatable, fun, and, or emotional regulation. People between the ages of 18 and 55 were found to have stronger musical identities than people above the age of 55. My third construct was method of listening, like streaming platform versus radio versus physical copies of music. So sh this, the streaming popularized right before the 2010s, and most participants streamed with only 37 report reportedly not streaming. Common themes in why people stream is convenience, lifestyle, and discovering new music. Many young people said that physical copies of music were cool, while older people said that they were outdated. My fourth construct is music genre. Certain music genres have uh, higher levels of attachment to, sh to musical identities. Participants of this study primarily reported genre labels to be either helpful or useless. With that said, many people streamed to increase their genre knowledge. Three limitations of this study is unequal demographics. Women made up well over half of the survey respondents with 84% women and 14% men. Future studies should have a more equal distribution representative of the sample. The second limitation is that this was an online survey, so people had no opportunity to explain their answers in full or ask clarifying questions. The third limitation is there could have been coding discrepancies um, and mistakes during my thematic analysis where codes were coded inconsistently, therefore leading to uh, inaccurate frequencies. For future research, one idea is a qualitative interview with older and younger people about their musical identities. This gives people the opportunity to allow, or allows people to explain exactly what they mean and why. A second idea is a qualitative focus group about physical copies of music versus streaming, and this would allow people of all ages to share their opinions and kind of give more insight to the cool versus outdated argument found in my research. And then a third idea is a quantitative survey about people posting music on social media. As social media becomes more popular, people use it to interact with music. One of these ways is individuals posting songs on Instagram stories or Facebook stories. So a survey about why this is occurring and what it means to them would be interesting. I had three main takeaways from my research. So according to uses and gratifications theory, this survey supports the idea that people are active in their media consumption. My research found significant support for my second hypothesis, 
which is that people stream to increase genre inclusivity or people stream to find new music. Next, social, according to social identity theory, research did not support the idea that men have stronger musical identities than other genders. This could mean that musical identity is not a strong social distinction among these participants, or it could mean that my unequal demographics sort of skewed the research there. Finally, 83% of participants found music to be important to their lives, but there were no significant differences between the genders on how it was significant or what it meant to them. However, the research indicated that younger people aged 18 to 55 do have stronger music identities than individuals 55 and above. This could be due to the introduction of new technologies like streaming platforms and social media, and this is also why I think a survey on that subject would be helpful for the research gap. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emma. And I'm Krista Farrell. And we did our research on emoji usage in digital text conversations. Our research is based on emoji usage that affects digital text conversation. Emojis are symbols which represent, um, represent objects, activities, facial expressions, and different things like that. Over time, emojis have evolved as it is a popular form of digital expression. Emojis are used in different many ways as we will discuss in further in the presentation. When gathering and supporting research for our study, we found evidence that affect digital text conversation with emojis, but we wanted to further understand our research. We have two supporting pieces of evidence of research. The first one is with the ability to express emotion, emojis have, tend to increase the chance for messages to be more liked by the receiver. And our second one is a neutral message sent with a positive emoji will be perceived as a positive message and vice versa with the negative emoticons. Our research question is, does the use of emojis affect digital text conversations? 
For our methodology, I'll be discussing our participants, procedures, and data analysis. For our participants, we had 12 Longwood students, which we recruited through text messaging and face-to-face. -face. For our procedures, we had 12 interviews with the average length of 10 minutes. We transcribed and recorded our interviews via Otter. For our data analysis, we used thematic analysis, which we developed themes through repetition, keywords, and forcefulness in our transcriptions. We came up with four themes. The first two is communicating without words, and the second one is emojis are engaging. For the first one, we found that participants we talked to discuss how emojis, um, they use emojis to communicate. They are able to use um, communicate without using any words. They are just using the emojis while still getting their message across and having the same understanding. An example of one is from one of our participants is sometimes you can express better in words what you can words can if you just use a facial reaction. You can't show the overall text in words, but you can show that show that with an emoji. And our second one is emojis are engaging. And we found that our participants utilize the emojis in conversations and we're able to use them in engaging and fun ways. With one of our participants said, I just feel it's more fun to text. And when I get excited, I like typing a bunch of random ones and sending them, but I just think it makes texting more exciting. For our other two themes, we found misinterpretation and professional conversations. For misinterpretation, we found that all of our participants had a common theme of misinterpretation with when using emojis. An example from one of our participants is, if anyone sends me a thumbs up emoji, I think they're mad at me. It could just be saying, okay, but I don't like when people do that because it comes off as passive aggressive. We also found a common theme of participants avoiding using emojis in serious and professional conversations. An example from one of our participants which supports this theme is, if you're talking about work, I don't think it's appropriate. I think you should try to say professional. But if my colleague is my best friend, I might send her a silly emoji depending on what we're talking about. Um, our research question was answer successively. We found that emojis do affect digital text conversations in many different ways. Emojis and context and emotions to messages and make conversations more fun and lighthearted and also can lead to misinterpretation and also avoidance in certain topics. Overall, we found that most of our participants had similar answers to our questions, which led us to the themes that we defined. Although there were limitations to our study and there is further research needed to understand the full effects of use of emojis in digital conversations, we were able to answer our research question. There was a common understanding of how to use emojis in conversations and how, and how they are understood. Emojis can positively impact relationships via digital communication. Even though there can be miscommunication, we found that it cannot be harmful. We found three limitations, which are age, understanding, and lack of diversity. For age, we interviewed Longwood students between the ages of 18 and 22, and they were 12 participants. Um, we had a good understanding that all our participants used emojis frequently and were able to um, use them in text conversations. Um, we had nobody who had, did not have a general understanding of emoji usage in text conversations. Um, we did have a lack of males. We had mostly female participants and we also found that uh, being at a PWI. For future research, we suggest three implications. We, also, we suggest a focus group to have conversations about emoji usage. We also suggest to have more examples from participants. From the focus group, people will be, be able to explain more of their experience with emojis when having a conversation. We also suggest to have a variety of age and background, having a larger age group, more genders, and more diversity in our participants. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for watching.
three participants in our survey, and our sample was from all current NCAA athletes, both Division I, II, and III. The results of our survey were non-significant for all of our hypotheses. For our discussion, we analyzed advertising and products and services. What this means is that if you are an athlete that has a deal with an NIL company, you are advertising their product via your social media and your following through your personal brand. Our second construct was brand of the university. This means that if you go to a school with a higher brand name like Duke, your, you know, your brand itself is going to grow in and of itself to help you grow your personal brand. The third construct is brand of student athletes. An example would be a student athlete growing their personal brand from social media platforms like Instagram and TikTok to create an online presence. The last construct is mental health of athletes within NIL deals. That example would be maintaining their social media may add stress on top of their academic and athletic performance. To move on to limitations, our first limitation were that participants were from the smaller schools. The second limitation is that NL is new. It was established in 2021, so there will not be enough NL education. And then the third limitation we have is we did not ask enough questions about athletes' individual brands. When it comes to further research, our first one we want to further study is transfer student athletes and whether or not NIL affects where they want to attend a university when they're in the transfer portal and whether or not NIL incentivizes them to enter the transfer portal at their prospective school. The second future research idea would be to redo this study in five years when NIL is more concrete and more established across the board. Our final future research study would be university NIL collectives and how they are funded across all levels, both mid-major and at the Power Five level. To wrap it up, NIL is constantly changing and it is very new. The NCAA needs more concrete rules across the board to help out mid-majors and Power Five conferences. Finally, mid-major schools need more education on NIL for their student athletes so that the athletes know the resources to them that are available to them. Thank you all for listening.
My name is Anna Cario, and I did research on how social media affects the mental health on college students. Um, the study aims to understand the research between the social media usage and the well-being of college students. My research questions were, how does social media influence college students' behavior? And the second research question was how does social media influence college students' mental health? The participants were active on at least one social media account, account and engaged with social media weekly either by creating or viewing content. The recruitment procedures were social media and Canvas message. The procedures were 12 interviews with an average of 15 minutes per interview, and the data was transcribed using otter.ai. The data analysis was a thematic analysis with the themes developed using repetitions, keywords, and forcefulness. The first theme found was confirmation bias. An example of this theme is demonstrated by the quote, when it comes to social media, that's why you look for things that confirm your beliefs. The second theme found was content, demonstrated by the following quotes. When post I, I'm posting once a week, but I'm spending time recording, editing, and making sure it's good. And the second quote demonstrates viewed content, just to, the content, because there's no point in watching something if it's not going to intrigue me. The third theme found was emotions, demonstrated by the following quote. It can negatively affect people by what they watch and how they view and how they perceive it. It can destroy people's mental health a bit. The research questions were answered by college mental health influences college students' behavior by affecting their emotions. The second research question was answered by social media influences college students' mental health by affecting their emotions. Confirmation bias is the tendency to see content to confirm existing beliefs. The impact is that social media users tend to prefer content that already aligns with their pre-existing beliefs or interests. The content, which was viewed content or posts that social media users interact with and created content, which is posts created by the social media users and shared with followers. The impact that social media platforms show content based on the user's influence, interest influencing both content they consume and create. And finally, emotions. Social media users experience a range of emotions when they view social media content. And the impact is social media posts can affect a user's emotions and behaviors. 
The limitations were the sample size. The, the study only had a limited sample size of 12 participants. They were, the second limitation was college students. The study participants were college students in a variety of academic fields and age. The, the study participants were all college age students. For future research, an increased sample size and um, observed participants for longer and the diversity of age in participants. Thank you so much.
Hi, I'm Kaya Carter, and I was focusing on social media's influences in terms of how it influences the political beliefs of young adults. So I really wanted to try to understand if social media influences the political beliefs of young adults and how. So previous research was done to try to um, understand this influence. Sachowski and their colleagues focuses on this perception of fake news on social media and only found significant evidence for Facebook. With my research, I attempted to broaden the scope and focus on all platforms of social media. Shihita and Amana study the development of political beliefs and focus on adolescence. Political beliefs development is one of my constructs and I tried to focus on the next age range from adolescence, which is young adults. So for my theories, I use cultivation theory, which states the more someone watches TV, the more they will be influenced by what they see on TV. And of course, I tried to apply that, but to social media and political beliefs. My first hypothesis was social media influences the political beliefs of young adults more than those who rely on social media than those who do not rely on social media for um, political news. My second hypothesis was young adults who rely on social media for political news are more likely to believe fake news than those who do not rely on social media for political news. So for my study, I conducted a quantitative survey which included 20 questions. My questions were ranking style questions, liquid scale, multiple choice, and open-ended style questions. At the end, I ended up with 73 participants, and of those who answered the demographic questions, 70% were female, 22% were male, and 4% identified as either non-binary or as third gender. 36% were liberal, 34% were moderate, and 8% were conservative. My first hypothesis did have significance. My second one, however, did not. And my third one, my post hoc hypothesis, did find significance. And that hypothesis was, young adults who discuss politics with their family and friends are more likely to believe fake news that they see on social media. So my first construct was social media consumption for political news. My ranking question focused on what um, method respondents use to gather their political news. And social media was the highest ranking method that respondents use to gather their political news. My second construct was the development of political beliefs. So most respondents indicated that they do talk about politics with their family and friends, which also um, influences their own political beliefs. My third construct was fake news on social media. Now, although most people indicated that they go to social media for their political news, they indicated that they are skeptical of the political news that they do see on social media. Therefore, they are not likely to believe the fake news on social media. And that takes me to my third construct, which is news gathering techniques. So because student uh, respondents were skeptical of the political news that they saw on social media, most of them, over 80%, indicated that they verify the political news they see on social media through Googling it and going to other resources and asking friends and family about it. So one limitation I ran into is that Longwood is a predominantly female institution. And as you saw with my 70% of response being female, there wasn't a really diverse sample in those terms. And I didn't focus on the specific social media platforms used by the respondents, which could have been helpful in understanding the type of messages that they were interacting with in terms of fake news on social media. And for my open-ended question when I asked um, how respondents verify their political news, there wasn't much of a um, diverse answers. So mo the major theme was that they verify it some kind of way. So in the future, if I were to do this again, I will ask questions about the specific social media platforms that the respondents use and the specific um, messages that they are seeing on social media, whether it's video-based or text-based. And I would like to gather a more diverse sample so that maybe not quite overwhelming majority be female. And I will want to construct more specific questions about how people verify their political news, like if they were to Google it, then what's the next step after that? So, from all of this, I learned that social media can influence the political beliefs of young adults. And aside from social media, families also influence the political beliefs of young adults. And social media usage, however, does not indicate whether a young adult will believe fake news on social media or not. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much.
Well, hello, we are back and we are moving through some of these presentations here. We did have a slight technical glitch earlier. We'll blame the matrix for causing that issue. So if you did want to tune into some of those presentations, tune in back today at about 2.57 and we'll get to see uh, Evan and George's presentation as well as Eliza's and Kennedy's presentation. So we'll come back at you those later on. Hope you're enjoying the behind the scenes view here. We've had our first session of posters finish up. And so they are churning out if we cut to the the uh, room right here, you can see a next group getting set up, ready to go uh, to, to continue on with Research Day with their poster presentations downstairs while we get ready for our next live research presentation. So stay tuned. We have more coming at you. Welcome to the real world learning of, from Generative Artificial Intelligence. My name is Duvi Johnnelly. I'm Char Levine, and this is our research presentation. For our research topic, we decided to look at the, the generative use of artificial intelligence. We decided by exploring the students' use of artificial intelligence to generate all classwork through editing, the generation of new work, and other miscellaneous uses. Our research gaps, such as from Pavlik 2023's collaboration with ChatGTP concerning the implications of generative artificial intelligence for journalism and media dedication, and another one from Al Arabare and Sosnik of 2024's investigation of the modern effect of gender and study level on the acceptance and use of generative AI by higher education students, comparative evidence from Poland and Egypt. Throughout our research, we decided to look at three research questions. How does regular uses of a generative artificial intelligence affect students' perceived ability to perform tasks without the use of AI? Our second question, how does regular usage of AI affect student learning by assisting them? And our third question, how does the regular use of generative AI hinder student learning? So for our participants, we wanted to target Longwood students of various departments. And the goal was to find students who, all of them use AI for classwork in some way. And by generative AI, we mean stuff like chat GPT, stuff that's going to, you can put in a keyword, you can put in a key phrase, and it'll spit out a phrase or an edited section for you. We asked acquaintances and strangers, as well as uh, people on apps like Yik Yak, anonymous apps, we conducted 12 interviews, all of which follow between six and 10 minutes, and we transcribed these interviews using apps like Zamzar and Otter. We analyzed our results using thematic analysis, which looks at repetition, keywords, and forcefulness in order to find certain categories or themes that our results fall under. For our results, we, had, we found a few themes. One of them would be used for augmentation rather than creation. As you see, some students do not use AI to generate entirely new work, and rather, on numerous occasions, describe this as simply foolish. An example is, responses to questions and time from scratch, never. Another would be, I don't think it's the safest thing for your grade. 
another one we found was the uses of generative AI, where students would use generative AI more than just editing and, cre and creating new work from scratch, with some notable examples being from study guides and citation machines. One, one example from a quote is, I guess science and data writing. Something else we saw was that a majority of students learned about AI from non-academic sources, such as from friends or from the internet. Only one person that we interviewed cited peer-reviewed sources as a source for learning about the tool that they were using regularly. An example of this is a student saying, so all that I've learned from like either professors or peers that know more about technology than I do. Something else was that a majority of students found there to be an ethical difference between using AI to generate new work versus using it for any other academic purpose, such as editing or creating existing study guides, with one student saying, I think generating new work is blatantly just dishonesty, cheating, and plagiarism. For our results, we found, for, for our results, we found three answers to our three questions. The first answer would be for our first question, the regular uses of generative artificial intelligence did not seem to affect students' perceived ability to perform tasks without the use of AI, meaning they don't have to rely on it all the time. For our second question, according to the participants, generative AI assists students by providing easy, to stu easy study guides, reliable copy editing, and ways to make learning much easier. One way that AI hinders student learning is by providing uh, sometimes inaccurate information, which can confuse students even more, leading to poor quality work. Finally, throughout our research, our overall data has led us to understand generative AI from a more academic viewpoint. We can understand that the use of generative AI has several uses for academic purposes that involve studying, creating outlines, and other useful guides. While inferring to the consequences that some AI use can bring, it may seem to have more negative effects than positive if using it other than generating ideas. And we can conclude that generative AI has an algorithm that offers more information depending on how much is inserted into the prompt. Therefore, as more specific prompts are entered, they will lead to more specific desires of the outcome. Many, some of our limitations include that many participate, uh, potential interviewees were unwilling to participate because they thought that our study would result in an on-record honor code violation for them, which potentially means that we may not have had a wide enough range of interviews from people who believed they were breaking the honor code by generating entirely new work. We also received brief answers from participants, which caused us to have to go out of our way and work harder to get more complete answers. And we also got people who were biased. Um, so most of the people who used AI were pro-AI. And people that don't think it's helpful won't use it, and therefore were not recruited for our study. Finally, we want to do more future research on generative artificial intelligence. The further study of AI is proof that AI is constantly changing and evolving. And the more we look into it, the better we can understand its algorithms, what exactly causes them to bring out this information. Another would be outside of academic learning. As we discovered, it offers more than just simple uses from writing and essays. Therefore, we can figure out more things to do. And finally, there are different types of AI. As, as you know, there's both generative AI and AI art. So, we, so the more we look into it, the more we can discover how AI is being constructed and made.
Jordan Epps, and this is my study on romance movies and reality. What is it? This is my research on how romance movies affect the way people perceive love in the real world. The, the um, theory I use for this study is cultivation theory. Cultivation theory states that long-term exposure to media shapes how media consumers perceive the real world. Uh, my first hypothesis was that increased amount of movies that you watch, romance movies, affects the way you perceive love more. My hypothesis number two was that if you don't fit into the heteronormative stereotypes that are shown in most romance movies, you are less likely to be, you are more likely to be um, uh, affected by this. My procedures, it was a short two-minute survey with sample questions with seven closed-ended and one open-ended. An example of a closed-ended question would be how, much, how many romance movies do you, how often do you watch romance movies? And uh, my open-ended question was um, why or why not do you, why or why do you choose to watch romance, oh my gosh. Why do you choose to watch romance movies? After filtering through the survey answers, I came up with 76 participants with demographics with adult, adults ages 18 to 65, with Caucasian, Black, African American, and Asian, male and female participants, and gender nonconforming. Both hypotheses, both hypotheses were non-significant. My first construct was romance movies, including drama, horror, horror, romance, and rom-coms. Examples of these would be 10 Things I Hate About You and The Titanic. Sexual orientation was my second construct, which is an enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to men, women, or both sexes. Construct number three is media consumption. The sum of information and entertainment media taken in by an individual or group. This is the amount of romance movies you watch on a normal basis. And construct number four is gender roles. Gender roles or sex role is a set of socially accepted behaviors and attitudes, behaviors deemed appropriate or desirable for individuals based on their sex. Limitations. My first flaw was a small sample size. My sample size was not cohesive for this experiment. Flaw number two. It wasn't a diverse enough sample. I had too many participants of the same race or same sexuality. Flaw number three. I need better aligned questions to be more straightforward for my participants so that they may understand why I'm asking better. For future research, my first idea was how sexuality affects romantic relations. For idea number two is how age affects romantic relations and how do romantic movies affect minority groups. I think all of these research options are important due to the research I've already, the research that I have previously done, and notice that each group is affected differently. For my discussion, despite the non-significant results, the study contributes to the ongoing disclosure on media influence, suggesting that individual differences in broader social context are critical in mediating the effects of media on personal perceptions. I hope to further this research in the future, and I enjoy doing this research now.
Good morning, I'm Sanchez. I'm Jamie. And this is our research concerning multifaceted identities on college campuses. We are presenting the findings from a study that focuses on an important aspect of higher education, the interpersonal relationships of multiracial students attending a predominantly white institution. One of the key research one of the key studies informing our research is by Key 2016 titled The Impacts of Microaggressions on the Performance of Multiracial and Monoracial College Students. This study sheds light on the challenges faced by multiracial students due to microaggressions, so we wanted to further that research by using a different approach that considers interpersonal relationships of multiracial students at predominantly white institutions. Our study seeks to address two main research questions. One, how does being a multiracial student attending a predominantly white institution affect interpersonal relationships in the classroom? And two, how does being a multiracial student attending a predominantly white institution affect interpersonal relationships outside of the classroom? Our research focused on demographics, including students who identify as more than one race or ethnicity, attend a predominantly white institution, or PWI, and are between the ages of 18 and 24. We use the recruitment practice known as snowball sampling, which is a sampling technique in which existing participants um, help recruit subsequent interviewees. We also posted on the social media sites Yik Yak and Instagram. We conducted 10, minutes that, 10 interviews that averaged 15 minutes in length, and these were recorded on smartphones and transcribed using otter.ai. We analyzed our data using thematic analysis in which we developed themes using repetition, keyword, and forcefulness. Our findings revealed three themes, one being code switching, which is where students alternate their style of speech based on the environment they're in. We found that students do not feel comfortable being themselves. One interviewee stated, with certain professors, I feel like I have to up my tone a little bit, kind of like be sterner, depending on who it is, I feel like I'm submitting my authority. Our second theme being microaggressions, which are intentional and unintentional everyday comments made towards historically marginalized groups of people. We found that disguised ignorance exists inside and outside of the classroom. One interviewee stated, what do you identify as? And it's not asked in a polite way. And then like, oh, well, you just told me you're a person of color, so can you speak for everybody? In our third theme, we found interpersonal relationships, or the connections and associations be built between one or more people, to be difficult to form for mixed race students. Participant five said, it's just, it wasn't welcoming. I had to really work hard to make friends with people of color. In regards to our first research question, we found that mixed students found it necessary to code switch in the classroom, but not outside of learning environments. Consistently, participants noted they had experienced microaggressions on, in, and out of the classroom. Our second research question yielded the results that mixed students were able to form meaningful interpersonal relationships while attending a predominantly white institution, but struggled to form relationships with professors. Our study contributes to existing literature by showing that multiracial minority students feel as if they must prove themselves within a classroom setting. It also shows us that low representation of minority faculty can affect students' performance and overall feelings about the classroom environments. It shows us that students feel as if they need to choose a side and that campus organizations are not set up in a way that is welcoming to multiracial students. Our research was limited by a lack of control unit in our participants. The lack of interviews with students who identify as a single race or ethnicity meant we did not have a comparison for the participants' experience, meaning we do not currently know if these findings are exclusive to mixed students or if they are a universal feeling across campus. Furthermore, only 4.5% of the sample population of students identify as mixed race, meaning we were extremely limited in students we were able to find to interview. Finally, some questions asked of interviewees were interpreted very differently leading to a variety of answers that made it difficult to find commonalities. Certain questions were also misunderstood, such as our question regarding the average classroom environment. While we intended the, class, the question to be about classroom culture and attitudes, some participants understood it to be literal, including one student who simply stated, there are a lot of chairs. We feel that future research would benefit from three factors. A larger university, where research would benefit from having a larger student body to pull from. Focus groups, which would allow for more information to be collected. As well as research that is focused on more of a singular group of multiracial individuals from the same background. Thank you.
Hey, Mr. Jace Frank. So Jace, how much stuff did you bring over here to set up this live mobile studio? Uh, a lot. Uh, there's about six cameras, uh, six or so lights, a um, whole bunch of microphones, a soundboard, a switcher. Uh, I had a blue cart that I was just trucking back and forth across campus. Uh, I maybe did like 10 trips uh, to get all this set up. It was a lot. It's a fun challenge. Have you ever done a live on location stream like this before? No, no. Uh, I, I tried to pre-plan as much as I could, uh, which for the most part, I got everything that I needed. Uh, there were some things that just popped up that I just did not think about. Uh, other things that I just did not work like I thought they were going to work, so I had to switch up in the moment. But overall, I'm pretty happy with how everything turned out. I know we are real happy too. It's very cool to be on li uh, live on location. So thank you again for making this happen. Back to the presentations. everyone, I'm Emily Rucker and I'm Heather Powers and today we'll be presenting our research on fitness influencers and purchasing habits. Our topic focuses on the relationship between fitness influencers, product promotions, brand endorsements, and the purchasing habits of their followers. So our research gap examines um, a 2020 study which found that influencer endorsements are seen as more trustworthy than their celebrity advertisement counterparts. Our research, uh, our research is aimed to examine if this is still true and why that relationship is there. We use social identity theory, which states that when someone sees themselves as part of a group, they are more likely to do more things to stay in that group. For our study, we are wondering if followers of a certain influencer will buy more products to stay up to date with that same influencer. Our two hypotheses state that young people interact with fitness influencers more than older people, 
and people who spend more time on social media are more likely to purchase products influencers promote. We used an online survey to conduct our research. It contained eight multiple choice questions and one open-ended question. An example of one of the questions we used from our survey is how often do you interact with fitness influencer content? After organizing our data, we had a total of 111 participants, with 71 responses being between the ages of 18 and 24, and 35 of them being between 25 and older. Our first two hypotheses, we found a significant relationship. In addition to that, we ran a post hoc test that predicted that people who had previously followed fitness influencers are more likely to purchase items from an influencer than those who aren't following them. However, there was no significant relationship found with our post hoc theory. For our first construct, we looked at age. So for this, we divided age into two categories. The first being college age individuals, so those age 18 to 24, and our second group being those who are 25 and older. With this, we found that younger people fin tend to follow more fitness influencers than older people. Our second construct looked at social media usage. With this, we measured how many hours on average participants reported spending on social media. From this, we divided those users into heavy, medium, and light users. With this, we found that those on social media more frequently, frequently buy more influencer products. Our third construct is gender, and we determined gender as female, male, and other. However, during our research process, we made the mistake of not including gender in our survey while gathering data, so further research examining gender is needed. Our fourth construct is purchasing habits, where we examine one's perceived habits and frequency of online purchasing to see how endorsements impact purchasing decisions. And with that, we found that younger people tend to purchase products that fitness influencers are promoting, more so than the 25 plus age range we surveyed. Some limitations of our research is that we did not ask further questions about engagement. Um, so we just asked if they followed fitness influencers and if they engaged with their content, but we didn't ask how often they liked, shared, and commented on those posts. Um, our second limitation is we didn't ask how many influencers they followed, so we just asked if they followed them or not, um, instead of asking how many they did. And then third, we would ask more open-ended questions to really get to figuring out why um, these trends were there. For future research, we suggest examining self-esteem as a construct and looking at how that affects purchasing decisions, and then further investigating gender as a construct, since that is a mistake we made during our process, and then investigating how economic factors contribute to purchasing habits as well. In conclusion, we found that 64% of participants stated that their purchasing habits are impacted by their social media use. Further, we found that 72% of participants stated that they had bought a product simply because it was endorsed by an influencer. With this, we encourage followers to be more careful about what they purchase and think about the product and its usefulness rather than just its endorsement. Thank you.
Well, joining me here after her presentation is Heather. So, Heather, how was the oral presentation? It was great. This was my second presentation of the day. Um, my first one was for a perspectives class, so it wasn't calm, but I love a good calm presentation, so this one was better. Well, tell us about that other one, though, because it was a different format and obviously different research. So how, how, what was that and how do they differ? Yeah, so I did a poster presentation, so we stand down for an hour, and people can come up to your uh, poster and ask you questions. That was for my doping and sports class. So I talked about um, elite cycling, Lance, Ar Lance Armstrong, and just cycling. Nice. And so what's your, what was your main conclusion from that one? Um, that there's a lot of doping in elite sports. So they're not successful in banning it. Apparently, Lance Armstrong, your effect uh, lives on to this day. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Back to the presentations. Hello everyone, my name is Jordan Taylor and my name is Olivia Delaney and our presentation is on the effects of social media marketing on sorority perception. So for our research topic, we chose to do social media marketing impacts on sorority perception. This research really examines how social media marketing strategies influence the perception of sororities among their viewers. For our research gap, we have two articles listed below. Um, the title of the first article is Role of Digital Marketing and Its Impact on Decision Making of Students in a Higher Education. The second article listed below, we have Communicative Intimacies, Influences, and Perceived Interconnectedness. For our research question, we chose to say, in what ways do social media recruitment videos impact the perception of sororities? So for our methodology, we had affiliated and non-affiliated members with Greek Life. Everyone was female and enrolled college students. For our recruitment procedures, we did face-to-face -face interactions and text message. We had 12 interviews conducted at an average length of nine minutes, and data was transcribed via Otter. For our data analysis, we had a thematic analysis. Themes were developed using repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. For our results, we had three common themes that we found. Our first one was alternative influences. This theme highlights the offline interactions that attract potential members and expresses the importance of authenticity in online representation. From an interviewee, we found a quote that states, in person you get to really know the person and their values and the sorority's values. Online is more just the involvement of certain things that they are in. The next theme is beyond social media. This theme talked about how social media provides a glimpse into sorority life, but there are limitations, like in-person interactions when defining a sorority's character. An example of a quote from an interviewee 
was, I don't think recruitment videos primarily had an impact on exactly which sorority I picked to be in, but I definitely could notice the top one I wanted to pick for myself after watching. Our final theme we found was highlight reel. This theme discusses how sororities rely on highlight reels through social media for marketing their sisterhood and authenticity while attracting interest and maintaining a positive reputation. Our, another quote that we found from an interviewee for this would be, I think showing lots of involvement with each other and other activities around campus helps a lot with great recruitment video and just not showing too much stage stuff and just more naturally how they are around each other. So our research question answers, we found that authenticity within digital content receives positive feedback from viewers. We also found from all of our interviewees that they felt that recruitment videos accurately showcased chapters. Lastly, we found that online recruitment videos help form initial interactions, but the in-person engagements and interactions are a lot more impactful. For further discussion, we found that social media has a great influence on reputation, whether that be positively or negatively. Um, we also found that recruitment videos help display organizations, but they aren't the deciding factor when individuals choose whether or not they want to be a part of Greek life or whether they're choosing a specific chapter they can see themselves joining. Some interviewees that we talked to said that some personal reasons they decided to not join Greek life were, for example, workload, finances, or stereotypes. Um, some other interviewees that did decide to join a sorority, they said the selection was highly based on relationships and the in-person interactions that they had during the recruitment time. So for our limitations, the first limitation was that we only had female participants. We would have gained other gender's perceptions if we had more feedback from more people. Next was small school. Uh, this just led to a smaller Greek life, additionally sm smaller social media pages and a smaller budget for production when it comes to sorority recruitment videos. Lastly was our interview sample size. We only had 12 participants out of a larger community of digital content users and Greek life participants. For future research, we thought it would be more beneficial if we did beginning and end of year interviews. This would be to compare um, perceptions to measure the value of recruitment videos from the beginning and the end. We also thought that freshman participants only would be more beneficial because it would avoid any bias. Um, conducting more interviews would diversify interviewees and further the research so we could gain more results. Lastly, providing examples, this would show physical content to avoid confusion and it would inspire more responses during the discussion of the interviews. And that's everything. Thank you guys so much for listening.
Hello, I'm Ireland McDermott. And I'm Julia Roth. And our presentation's on social media and parenting. So our research topic is on centered around the ethics of parents excessively sharing photos of their children on social media. With that, our research gap is trying to fill current literature that may not adequately address the ethical considerations surrounding how much is too much. Therefore, our research gap is trying to fill the issues related to obtaining consent from minors and the lack of direct feedback from the affected groups. Our theories used is the uses and gratification theory to determine why parents use social media platforms to share content and information about their children to fulfill specific needs. We have two hypotheses. Our first one is the more parents post personal information about their children online, the more a child's digital footprint will be impacted. If children had more control about what their parents post on social media, then their mental health will improve is our second hypothesis. For our methodology, we used a survey by Qualtrics. We had 13 questions, 12 being a Likert scale and one being open-ended, and the average participant took about four to seven minutes to complete it. Examples of some of the questions we use are, how often do your parents post about you on their social media platforms, and how has social media impacted your mental health? Our demographic questions included age, gender, and activity on social media. For our participants, our final amount of participants was 89. And again, our demographics targeted college age students, which was 18 to 24. And then we had a second category, which was 25 and older. For our results, as Julia said, our first hypothesis was yielded not significant with a p-value of 0 0.09. However, the second one about control and mental health in parents posting was significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. For our post hoc hypothesis, we um, said the more control a child has, the better their relationship with social media, and the better their mental health, which was also yielded significant with a p-value of 0 0.001 or less. So we had four constructs in total. Our first one is social media activity and its digital footprint. With that, we predicted that the more parents post personal information about their children online, the more a child's digital footprint will be impacted in the future. Our first question was able to illustrate how much do your parents post about you on their social media platforms. And it also helped us determine that our hypothesis was not supported as the Pearson correlation for the two variables was non-significant. Non Therefore, the results did not show a significant relationship. For our second one, we did mental health and self-esteem. Accordingly, we predicted that if children had more control about what their parents post on social media, then their mental health will improve. Question five from our survey states, how often do you feel your parents have asked for your opinion or permission to post content of you on their social media platforms? This question helped us illustrate that our hypothesis was supported as the Pearson correlation for the two variables was significant. Therefore, the results showed a significant relationship. Our third one is control, consent, and privacy. Likewise to the previous construct, we predicted that if children had more control over what their parents posted on social media, then the mental health of them will improve. Our question five from our survey states, how often do you feel your parents have asked you for your opinion or permission to post about you on their social media platforms? This question helped us illustrate our hypothesis that was supported as the Pearson correlation was significant and the results also showed a significant relationship. Construct four talks about parental influence. Our final hypothesis predicted that there are, are more control, the more control a child has, the better their relationship is with social media. Question four states, when you think back on your childhood, how much do you think parents' extensive online disclosure of personal information about you has shaped, their, has shaped your views on digital security and privacy? This question helped us demonstrate that our final hypothesis was not supported as the Pearson correlation for the two variables was non-significant. After discussing our limitations, the first one we found was the number of participants in our study. We had a total of 89, however, if we were to get more than 89, it would yield a more accurate statistics and more accurate result when doing the t-test. For our second limitation, we chose the questions within the constructs. Within the four constructs that Julia already said, we put them into categories in our survey. However, with the Likert scale on the questions, they didn't completely fit. So after going through the Likert scale, our participants' answers didn't completely match, which could have altered our t-test. And the third limitation was survey completion. So some of the participants who, who um, took our survey 
did not complete it, so then we couldn't use the, their information in the t-test, which then gave us less participants to work with throughout the whole survey. For our future research, our first idea kind of goes back to the limitations to utilize more social media and outreach. So we use GroupMe, Facebook, and Instagram to outreach um, to get people to, to take our survey. However, we thought we could try Snapchat because a lot of college-age kids use Snapchat and also um, word of mouth and face-to-face -face within campus because on campus is, is our targeted demographic, so we could have went around campus and asked people to fill out our survey that way to both get more participants and have a more um, accurate study. For the second idea, we could have done a dual survey and had more questions about um, how parents outlook, what parents' outlook is on social media. Um, nowadays with social media, parents can post more and have more um, ability to put their children online, whether that be for family, friends, or just because they want to. But some of our questions were more targeted to two parents, and our demographic was mostly college-age kids, which could have thrown off our results. And lastly, we could have added more demographic or general questions, such as um, what social media platforms do you have? Um, how often are you on social media? How often do your parents post? Or do your parents have social media? Which could have given us more accurate results as well. And then finally for the discussion, two things we found significant were the correlation for our second hypothesis. Um, a child's mental health improving was strongly correlated to their ability to have some control over what their parents post about them with the R value being 0.83. Um, with that being said, that just proves that if a child would have more of a say what their parents post, their mental health would improve as well as their um, relationship with social media. Um, the second one had to do with the, the digital footprint. So many responses within our open-ended questions indicated that childhood posts do not bear a large effect on mental health because people enjoy looking back at photos that their parents posted. Um, if you look at the top, that's our open-ended question. If given the opportunity to take down photos posted from your childhood, would you? Do you feel this would impact your mental health positively, negatively, or have no change? Please provide a short explanation. Um, some example responses were, I would not, I do not have many photos of me as a younger kid. So it's fun to look back on my parents' Instagram and see those items. And no, I enjoy looking back on old photos of me and my sister when we were younger. And a lot of participants also said they would not change anything. So to wrap up our presentation, we included two photos that our parents posted as children just to prove that although it wasn't big when we were little, it still has something to do with our generation and it will keep improving. Thank you. Thank you. Well, joining me right now is Mr. Clint Wright, Dr. Awesome, one of the original founders of live streaming research here. So how does it feel to do, uh, see this all on location now? I mean, this is fantastic. I, I really love the, it, it's everything we were doing before, but it's kind of a, it's a fun little flex to bring it out here and, and make, it a, make it a much more tangible part of the university's process. And I think that, that's awesome. I love to see your baby grow like this. So back to the research here. Good afternoon, my name is Whitney Haywood. And I'm Sarah Lowry. And this is our research project on music and emotions. So what is our research topic? We decided to dive into music and the ways that it can influence and affect your emotions. We wanted to see more into the minds of the younger generation and how they relate to music and how they feel about it and what they feel about it. This was mostly pertaining to college students. So for our research questions, we had two. Our first one was, how or in what way does one's mood influence their choice of music? In what ways does music affect a person's mood based on their current mental state? For our methodology, the participant demographics we chose were 18 to 25 year old college students, music enthusiasts, and then for our recruitment procedures, we did it via social media, basically with Instagram and Snapchat, and then we did face-to-face -face recruiting as well. 
The procedures were 12 interviews, each of them the average length was 10 minutes, and our data was transcribed via researchers and an easy recorder app. And for our analysis, we used thematic analysis, and our themes were developed using repetition, keywords, and forcefulness. So our first two themes that we dived into were emotional response and cultural identity. With, culture, with emotional response, the emotional connection that subjects had to their music and why they had this connection. So a quote from one of our interviewees is that they also tend to listen to the words a lot in music. So if it's something that they can connect with, oh, that's really saying something powerful, then that's really good. I like that. Also, just the vibes of the song. Another quote would be, a good majority of newer songs are related to movies, and hearing those songs help me go back to the scene of or movie. So for cultural identity, even though it was only mentioned a few times, cultural identity was very important to be mentioned in our research. So another quote would be, being a black man, obviously hip hop is such an embedded part of black culture in America, so it's just one more reason as to why I should be leaning into that category more. Our two other themes were influences and activity. With influences, we focused on the majority of the participants discussing how certain things around them take part in inspiring their music or playlist choice, with a quote being, I'm influenced by my friends, especially jam music. I wasn't really introduced to the whole genre until I got to Hampton, Sydney, but I like it a lot now. And then my dad always tells everyone that when I was born, he brought me home from the hospital listening to ACDC. Um, for our activities, we focused on participants that gave information about the things they do when listening to music or the certain ways music reminds them of an activity, with a quote being, yeah, I do believe that when I'm out driving and I hear a certain song, I'm inclined to drive faster and get really into the moment, or if I'm out with my friends dancing and I hear a certain song, I really want to start dancing and singing along with my friends. So the results to our two research questions, we have the results for this research paper provide evidence that music and emotions do go hand in hand with each other. The information given by interviewees show that the main connections with music and their emotions would be the emotional responses, cultural identity, influences, and the activity they are doing. Each showed a connection across all 12 interviews and it pertained to the subject's emotions. The emotional response connected to people's feelings during their music listening. Whether happy or sad, subjects were able to articulate that in the interviews. When looking at the cultural identity and one's connection to music, race, and their upbringing factored into what they listened to or were exposed to. The influences were consistent throughout regarding who they listened to or why they listened to certain things. Lastly, what people do when they listen to music was prominent in our findings and our research. For our discussion section, we noticed that everyday people listen to music intentionally or unintentionally. We believe music puts your thoughts into words in ways you cannot. People tend to put on music when doing activities, no matter how big or small, so that they may stay motivated in their tasks at hand. The friends who you surround yourself with shape the music you listen to and what type of person you become as well. And lastly, music influences us in ways we sometimes struggle to articulate, and our playlists can help do that. For our limitations, we have only interviewed acquaintances, limited amount of questions, and interviewed separately. For only interviewed acquaintances, only allowing for like-minded subjects, easier for them to open up and give personal information. For limited amount of questions, more would have offered a longer discussion and reduced the topics of conversations. Interviewed separately, together would have allowed for a better recording, but both were not familiar of other interviews. And for future research, we recommend there be a higher sample size. Only 12 interviews were conducted, and a bigger sample size would allow for more consistently, consistency across the board. We would suggest to do focus groups, um, because they would allow for subjects to bounce ideas off of each other and give insight into the community that music is. Uh, and then lastly, we would say to interview a wider age range, and this would allow for more discussion about streaming platforms, and the, the difference in ages could be assessed as well. And thank you for listening to our thank presentation. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, my name is Leighton Hollowell. Uh, today I'll be talking about the effect of advertising and fandom on sports wagering. Uh, what is it? Basically I wanted to analyze the effects of fan bias, um, comfortability towards betting on a sports team, and the way that advertising is shaped in the sports wagering community today. Um, so basically the uh, diffusions of research theory uh, I wanted to use is new ideas or procedures. It's basically uh, discussing how Gambling from back in the day has changed to today. It just shows how uh, time periods can be different. Um, a lot of new landscape and a lot of new technology. Uh, my H1 is uh, if an individual is to bet on their own sports team, they're likely to put more money down. And then my H2 was if a celebrity attaches their name to a parlay or a uh, straight pick, the user is more likely to place the bet due to comfortability to knowing that celebrity status. Uh, the procedures was a 12 question survey. Uh, ten multiple choice, two short answer. Uh, the survey took about three to four minutes to complete. Uh, a few sample questions, one uh, specifically as an example would be how would you describe yourself as a gambler? And then uh, the participants, the final number was about 103 uh, survey responses. The demographics that we fielded were university students and experience with sports wagering. Uh, the results of our findings were H1 was significant, uh, hypothesis 2 was non-significant and the pH 1 was significant as well. Uh, sports wagering is advertised in many different ways. Um, as you can see on the slideshow right here, uh, they use celebrity status as Kevin Hart's being used. Uh, sometimes they wait till the biggest games of the year, uh, specifically the Super Bowl, NBA Finals, the Masters. Uh, they're really good with knowing when to put out advertisements and knowing who to use and when. Uh, and how fandom, uh, fandom excuse me, affects wagering. Um, as you can see, we did a uh, study once a week, once a month, and once a day for wagering. And uh, you can actually see by the results that if you were uh, bet once a day, you are more likely to bet on your sports team. You have more knowledge and more understanding of injuries and player status and matchups and uh, specifics uh, such as that. Uh, free money has really been uh, gigantic in the sports betting community. It has drawn in pr uh, pr prospects from across the country, not even just America, across the world, people are beginning to sports bet. Um, as you can see in the bottom 
If you bet a dollar, you get a free $100. That's a pretty big incentive for non-sports gamblers as well as sports gamblers because that does give them the incentive to wait till they're 21 to gamble. And um, as well as that, the use of celebrity status has had a mass uh, massive impact on the sports wagering uh, community. As you can see, JJ Reddick down below uh, was a parlay there. Um, we, fit, we found out through our research that you are more likely to bet on a parlay or a straight pick uh, based on the celebrity that is being attached to the pick. Uh, as you can see in the limitations here, um, not surveying to strictly diehard sports fans, we were restricted to just the Longwood University campus, which might not have been the greatest uh, area to poll for sports wagering, maybe uh, go around the country, visit sports wagering uh, communities. Uh, limitation two, be more specific in our questions for the survey. There were a lot of straight answers, yes, no, how often, uh, maybe give more of a broader range for the people to respond. Uh, and limitation three, just offering multiple short answer questions, get more of a feel for how the people gamble, what they gamble on, and why they gamble. Uh, for future research, um, idea one could be set up uh, a tabling event, and idea two, Add just more research regarding uh, betting trends within the wagering community, just to you know, kind of get a feel of what people are betting on at this point like in time. Uh, specifically, the research started around the Super Bowl, so a lot of the advertisements we did study were in regards to the Super Bowl, um, as you can see from the Kevin Hart advertisement. And idea number three is just add a question regarding how much money you've either won or lost in your gambling career. I think it's very good. Uh, perspective to see how the gambling community has been shaped, whether or not people are just gambling for fun or people are actually gambling to win money and help out their um, bank. And then final results, um, the completion of the survey and further research showcased how important comfortability was with the research methods. Uh, comfortability was seen as everything. If you're comfortable with the players, you're more likely to bet on them. If you're not as comfortable with the team and you don't know as much about the team, you are less likely to bet on them. Uh, celebrity status didn't affect individuals as much as previously thought. Um, people, I guess, tended to stay more towards their uh, opinions regarding the sports gambling. And then free promotional money obviously did attract a good amount of people. Uh, even if you weren't a sports uh, better, it attracts you in. And the more comfortable you are with the sports team, uh, the more comfortable you'll be with wagering. Uh, in uh, final conclusions, the study was a great job. Um, I think the study was super important to get a grasp of the community, and overall, I think the study did a great job. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Leighton, for wrapping up our morning sessions. Dr. Hosterman, what do you think of our research so far? Oh, they've been knocking it out of the park. Our community is really engaged. They're doing some fantastic research and confident in front of that camera. I love to see it here. So we will be back. We have an hour break for lunch. So we will be back on our YouTube channel here at 1 p.m. Starting with more presentations. So please come back in an hour. We'll see you soon, YouTube. Rush calm. <laughs>